We all learn about the first Thanksgiving in school, but what if I told you just miles away from Plymouth Rock, there was another group of settlers? A pagan oasis whose way of life was the antithesis to the puritanical social mores of the pilgrims. A society whose freedom and open-mindedness was so startling to the pilgrims that they would do anything in their power to stop it. Check it out. Just four years after the Mayflower landed in what later became the United States, another ship, aptly titled Unity, set sail for the New England coast. Aboard this ship was Thomas Morton, a well-educated, well-connected, free-thinking Englishman who has been described by some as America's first hippie. Morton and his men arrived in Plymouth, but found that they couldn't get along with the literally puritanical Christians that they found there. So they decided to start their own community called Marymount in what is now Quincy, Massachusetts. Marymount was a colonial utopia in which the settlers were considered consociates. They lived in harmony with the Algonquin Indians. The Puritans were horrified that the liberal-minded Morton and his men consorted with Native American women. They considered Morton an irreverent, drunken libertine. And they weren't exactly thrilled that his easygoing colony attracted escapees from Plymouth's strict orthodoxy. Then, on May 1st, 1627, the inhabitants of Marymount, along with some Native American friends, erected an 80-foot pole around which they drank, danced, and drummed. Below the pole was the inscription, The first of May at Marymount shall be kept holy day. The governor of Massachusetts at that time, William Bradford, was horrified by the beastly practices of drunken orgiastic celebration. Bradford wrote about Marymount when compiling a history of Plymouth Plantation. He wrote that those who frequented the Maypole led a dissolute life, pouring out themselves into all kinds of profanities, calling Morton the Lord of Misrule, and accusing him of being an atheist as well as, quote, dancing and frisking with Native American women as well as worse practices, end quote. He went on to say that all the scum of the country would flock to Morton from all kinds of places. So the next year, on May 1st, when Marymount was planning their next May Day celebration, Miles Standish, the military advisor for the Pilgrims, came in, arresting Morton and substantially damaging the 80-foot maypole. Not a single shot was fired. According to Morton, the people of Marymount didn't want any bloodshed while Bradford said they were just too intoxicated to resist. Now, initially, Bradford wanted to execute Morton, but knowing of his connections in high places back in England, he decided to maroon him on an island instead. A British ship eventually took Morton back to England, and he soon set sail once again for America. Meanwhile, Marymount was raided by John Endicott and Puritans from Salem, who stole the food supply of the pagan utopia and burned down the Maypole once and for all. When Morton arrived in America several months later, he found his Native American friends decimated by the plague and many of Marymount's inhabitants scattered across Massachusetts colony as the Puritan strength increased. Soon, they arrested Morton once again and burned down Marymount. Morton began plotting his revenge. He used his connections to be sent back to England, where he succeeded in getting King Charles to revoke the charter for Massachusetts colony. Primarily because King Charles didn't really like the Puritans either. That's, after all, why they came to America. Anyway, while he was there, Morton penned The New English Canaan, a witty composition that praised the wisdom and humanity of the Native Americans while absolutely ridiculing the Pilgrims. It made him a celebrity in some circles back in England, and of course angered the Pilgrims, becoming the first book ever banned in America. After the charter for Massachusetts was officially revoked, Morton headed back to Plymouth and was once again arrested, primarily because they were so angry at him for getting the charter for Massachusetts colony revoked. Because he was now aging, they felt pity and freed him, but they did banish him still. He spent his final days in York, Maine. But Morton's ideas and ideology lived on. Anne Hutchinson, for instance, was a resident of Marymount and a charismatic spiritual leader in Massachusetts who taught a brand of Christianity that threatened to destroy the puritanical Christian community of Massachusetts before she was ultimately banished from the colony. Similarly, Roger Williams was banished for his beliefs of religious freedom and separation of church and state, 
leading to the foundation of the more tolerant city of Providence and the establishment of Rhode Island. And so there you have it. You know, I told the story of Marymount because I think it's an important uh, chapter in American history and one that you'll never hear about in a history textbook because, unfortunately, history is always written by the victors. The battle for the spirit of America between the puritanical work ethic and the desire for freedom and tolerance as espoused by Morton and the natives and uh, all of the people there at Marymount has been waging for over 400 years. And all too often... The moralistic prudes have won, refusing to accept anything at all that they cannot control. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody.